ladies and gentlemen, I hope everything is working properly uh, because <laughs> you, you, we, it never is here at the Lore Lodge studio, which I say studio as if this isn't a second bedroom in an apartment complex in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. But, uh, but you have a nice wooden board slapped up behind you and it's painted. <laughs> and you would think that this is a wooden board, but in fact, this is contact paper. The actual wooden board is on the other wall. Um, <laughs> there's, there is, in fact, a, a stained, painted wooden board on the other wall, but it's not this one. Uh, uh, you got that laminate wall. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That laminate. Moving up in the world. Exactly. Uh, but, obviously, last time we did History Hut as a podcast, it was not even on this channel, and it was over on Twitch. I thought, you know what, let's do it here on the Lore Lodge channel, build some hype, introduce you guys all to the format and the program now that we have an episode out of the way. The way this show is going to work in, uh, you know, for the indifferent future, indifferent, uh, not indifferent. Iterations. That was not the word I was looking for. Um, anyway, the way this, this show is going to work for the foreseeable future is that it'll be me and Steven being the main co-hosts. It'll be us every month with a rotating cast of other content creators, historians, uh, you know, scholars, whatnot, whatever we can kind of scrounge up, whoever's interested in coming on the show to talk about various topics. And uh, today we have the illustrious Ryan Day, also known as History Daddy. Ryan, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi guys, um, I am I am the history daddy. Um, most of you will probably know me for being very obsessed with Alexander the Great. Um, I now do um, long form content on on YouTube. Um, I normally split into multiple parts, um, and I do little history sketches, which I I I'm always just about skirting the TikTok guidelines. Um, so yeah, um, I also I'm on Instagram as well. How yeah. many uh, how many TikTok uh, no nos have you picked up? Um, surprisingly little. Do you, do you know what's really funny is, um, I my favorite um TikTok no no I picked up was for hate speech and bullying, and the the person I was bullying in the video was a certain Austrian painter. Um, <laughs> so that got reinstated when I made a video pointing that out. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. So I what? I recently no I recently made a video where I was driving past some people who had an SS flag up on the highway. I've like on, like, on like a the bridge. actual thunderbolts, like, like the actual thunderbolts. thunderbolts. Yeah, you're holding that up over I seventy six as I'm driving through Valley Forge Park, and uh, and that that is the Valley Forge for for the Americans in the audience. Um, that is the one from the war. Uh, I was driving through there, and I thought, you know, that's pretty ironic. A bunch of neo Nazis in a park dedicated to freedom. Um, and I I rolled down my window and I took out my phone. And I I was like, you know take off they were wearing masks and i yelled take off the masks you pussies um and uh and tiktok did not like that it got removed for harassment and bullying and i was like i feel like this group of people this group of people seems like a fair target you know yeah (laughs) but yeah i think i've caught at least a dozen community guidelines no-nos on tiktok if we're counting if we're counting ones that weren't repealed uh every single mom millennial video Every single oh. one of them had a community guidelines violation. Yeah, well, there was also, I would say that was back during the time where everything was being spammed constantly yeah. for community guidelines. I mean, yeah. I, I'll say this. I don't want to jinx myself when saying this right now, but I have not gotten a community viol- like guideline violation in probably a good eight or nine months, I think, which is incredible because it used to be every single week there was multiple, mm-hmm. and now there's not. Yeah. And that's not even with any controversy that was going on at the time. That was just the standard of what would happen. Yeah, I think one of the first, like, interactions you and I had on TikTok was, in fact, me defending you for, like, somebody trying to cancel you. Uh, oh, God. Yeah, yeah, wait, there, there have been multiple of those. Yeah, I think it was when you did uh, Larry Thorne. You did a video oh, yeah, him, yeah, yeah. Was, Still yeah. to this day, if I see a, a video that has attacked me, usually you'll see detractors that are in the comments that, are, that bring up that exact one of, like, oh, this is the guy who defended Nazis. Yeah. It's like, no, no, this is the guy this who guy talked who about a guy. About a Finnish guy. <laughs> I remember the, the whole Larry Ford. I think that's the first video of mine you you commented on as well, was the Larry Ford <laughs> stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, that would that like, would have stuck by to this day from people who refuse to understand that context is a thing. Mm-hmm. It's an important thing, too. But I wanted I wanted to bring us back around by, by mentioning uh, our, our good friend Donna um, over over at TikTok, uh, who I think after after trying her very best to cancel me got herself banned um i i do think that's what Back happened because she well yeah she only got like a thousand followers um might be up to 10k <laughs> i don't know anyway the reason i brought that that kind of around was because we are talking about roman britain and obviously you know <laughs> 
obviously you can't have Rome and Britain without Rome. So the the topic we chose for tonight is primarily in terms of singular characters. We're going to be focusing on Boudicca, who was a um, I'm I'm trying to think of the right word to describe her. Uh, fierce seems like a solid one. A, yeah, a fearsome, yeah. a fearsome uh, Britonic queen of the Iceni. The Iceni, of course, were just one of the many, many, many tribes of Celtic Britain because for most of uh, for, for most of ancient history, it was not Roman. <laughs> um, no. Not even remotely. And even when it was Roman, it wasn't totally Roman. Uh, Gildas, Gildas wrote that if they didn't, re if they didn't um, return to the structure and order of the Roman cities and they lived like their, their brothers out in the fens, that they would be conquered. They would be de destroyed by outsiders, their identity lost, their homeland gone forever. Uh, Gildas wrote that in, I want to say it was the 500s. The late the mid to late 500s the ruin of britain uh gildas was correct because very soon after that a whole bunch of saxons came um oh yeah yeah so hi guys <laughs> <laughs> hey ryan <laughs> thanks for what you did to my people uh, <laughs> i'd say it's hey, not 30 percent english myself but the reason i wanted to bring all that up is because to understand why why a rebellion like what Boudicca put together had to happen, why there was the sort of brutality that you're going to hear about, you need to understand what happened in Rome, what happened in Rome and Britain, how that invasion all came together. And I think mm. for, for the most part, a lot of people have this perception that Rome just invaded Britain, conquered it, and was there for a few hundred years, and then they went home. Not what happened. It was a much more gradual process, beginning with Caesar's invasion in, what was that, 53 B.C.? I, I, want to say 43. I want to say 43. That's when he was killed. Because there was multiple. Hold on. Which one was it? I, the first, I, no, the first was, invasion was... of Britain by Caesar, I believe, was 55 or 53 BC. Hold on. Was... I'm going to look this up right now because okay. it's going to bother me. We Jamie, have Jamie, pull dates. that shit up. This is the history page. We need to pull up the specific dates. Hold on. What's hilarious, what's hilarious is I literally said before we get started, I'm not too good on the dates, guys. <laughs> no, we've we got to the fine. first date. The very first date. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's um, it's fine. I was, I mean, I also studied Britain as like my concentration, so I'm a little, so it's, it's a little unfair for me to for me to look to you guys for help. But um, you know, as as for Rome, I assume everyone in the chat, everybody, all the viewers, all that. Yep. Have a, okay, I was right. Fifty five. Yep. Fifty five BC and fifty four. He did it twice because the yeah. first one didn't work out so well. As many times invading Britain did not exactly work the out. The second so well. time didn't work out no. so well either. Like, no, who, who's it wouldn't the first? Mean to like what? 42, Claudius, forty-three. It's Claudius who finally mm. gets it done. Um, I think, <laughs> and if I remember correctly, it's just Claudius is like, man, I really, really need a win because he had no no military victories to speak of. And for those that don't understand, in the ancient Roman world, military victories were everything. That oh, was absolutely that was the most important thing you could do. Stephen, do you want to talk about it? I can explain. It. I've actually talked about this before because it's one of those things that really confuses people. But there are when someone talks about, say, the differences between Carthage and Rome, right? You have two extreme variants of uh, of ideology when it comes to military. If Carthage or if Rome is pure attack, Carthage was pure defense, and there's a key reason why that mentality uh, that mentality was built into the leaders. It was built into their military leaders because in the Roman system. The highest position within society that you could have in a very militaristic society was to be a consul. And a consul, when you were elected it, and there was two consuls, and that's it, they ruled for one year. That's it. And so if you didn't achieve any kind of military significance during that time, when your whole job is to be the military man in a very, very militaristic society, you were seen as weak and you lost any viability for any other political office in the future. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't do anything. So people were constantly looking in Rome for any kind of excuse that they possibly could to just go out and achieve a little bit of glory, yep. you know, spice things up, maybe spill a little blood, fertilize the field, if you will, that they, they were always looking for it. And so they were encouraged actively every time of trying to attack. And this is one mm -hmm. of the key things that like Hannibal Barca as an example is able to use against the Romans because he knew if he just bided his time a little bit, he could make the Romans come mm -hmm. to him and trap them because their job was going to be up. It's like the opposite yeah. of a lame duck presidency. Was Whereas, was Kanae the one where 
they, he lined up his heavy infantry on the sides and his light infantry in the center, knowing the Romans would push. So that they would fold the form yeah. of U-shape. Yes, yes, and encircle them. Um, they and lost, they, what, they 80, the Jinkins, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> two, two consular arms. Yep. And then the Carthaginians had the exact opposite approach, and that was uh, if a general lost a battle, he was executed. Basically. Oh, so yeah, yeah. So oh. if um, it's it's like if you returned back to Carthage in disgrace, if you lost, you could lose everything, and so you didn't get a chance, another chance. Its failure was met with your destruction. Political wise, you could be executed. There's any number of ways a society would turn against you because Carthage had its own kind of oligarchic system that was similar to what you could have of the uh, the like the Roman Senate where all these rich people were in charge and they were simultaneously looking every single time to sabotage each other to try and take power. You know, the classic mm -hmm. patrician class, if you will, among anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, the exact opposite scenarios of if they lose, they could die. So Carthage was always usually playing more defensive mm -hmm. to try and find the perfect opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's also why you get such a weird decision as marching elephants over the Alps instead of sailing them into Sicily. Like... <laughs> There's there's all these weird little things that Hannibal did that make so much more sense when you understand the the culture and the broader system within he, which he was working because oh, there's yeah. I, I think we look at a lot of these ancient societies and we have a tendency to look at them and think the way that we do today and judge their decisions oh. in that manner and it's just you can't do that because it doesn't make any sense and you also we we sit back and we laugh at something like the the Persian Wars and then the Peloponnesian War following and we look at it and we're like ah that's so silly. I can't believe that people did that and then also did basically the same thing a couple hundred years later with Carthage and Rome. Um, but they didn't have the the knowledge and the context for the most part. The average person did not have access to the, the writings of Thucydides. That was not something they were going to have. So you have people making completely different decisions and even the educated class are going to be, you know, think about it today. Military leaders, what are they trained with? They have to, to look back on. They have Xerxes. They have Alexander. They have Caesar. They have uh, a whole bunch of people through the Middle Ages. They have Napoleon. Um, who who did Caesar have? Oh, that's true. Like at the time, you would have been looking at the the you'd be looking at the earlier Greek conquests, since that's mm -hmm. where a lot of the education class came out of. Specifically, was Greek educators learning about those like the ancient battles? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's if, specifically what they would have been studying. I mean, I mean, there's um. One of one of my favorite like quotes from from Julius Kaiser is like where he was just absolutely gut wrenchingly hurt to to because we see him as a great conqueror. He saw himself as a pathetic loser who had never achieved anything near Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. Like oh, yeah. he, he sobbed over Alexander's grave if the stories are true, which you know again which goes back to these mindsets because a lot of the sources at the time are wait, like. Whenever someone says, oh, he sobbed over Alexander's grave, that's obviously going to make him look a little less ma masculine in Roman society. But that's the thing. Is so, I'm not sure it would in Roman society. Really? Okay. Okay. I, no, not for military glory. Like, men were expected to be able to show emotion, but it was specifically over things for remorse or mm -hmm. sadness in regards to, like, something that was lost. Not, okay. like, you weren't going to be a whiny little shit about it, but yeah, simultaneously yeah. <laughs> it was... Oh, woe is me! I will never achieve the greatness of what came before. Yeah. It's a very different yeah. mentality when it comes to Roman society versus another. Yeah, to to cry mm. over the death of Caesar or something like that in Rome would have been an understandable occasion. That would have been. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I'm, I'm harping on Caesar so much is that this is, you know, th this is the guy who who makes that first step, Propel who goes into yes. Britain, because this is, I think, with Caesar. Just to quickly give a biography of the guy. He was not, he was born into the patrician class, but to an impoverished house. He was mm -hmm. yes. not a wealthy man. His parents were not wealthy. He was not like a lot of the other people within his own class who could enter the military at a higher rank, who could lead from the jump. This is a guy who was going to have to start in the legions, and he did. And he fought through the legions, and he made his way up, and he eventually finally gets into the Senate, and then he finally becomes a consul. This is a guy who fought tooth and nail, fit, like literally fought tooth and nail to get to where he was. And then when he finally gets a command, he knows, like you said, Stephen, he's only got one year. He's only got yep. the yep. length of time. Well, that, uh, he ultimately didn't, but yeah. he was supposed to have. <laughs> supposed because you know, by that time, one. they were abusing the system he, greatly. He, he made a very, very, um, as they say, pro-gamer move. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the thing was, he could only stay in the field as long as he was winning. But he yep, also yep. only, he knew he only had that limited period of time to make or break his entire family, not just himself at this point, 
if he failed, his house was done. The 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 house of Julia was not going to matter anymore. That, that's why I like the fact that um, I don't know how true it is, but apparently when he was in Gaul, especially, um, he may or may not have uh, reported only the winnings. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know 100% how true that is. Um, it's basically I, that he's never defeated in Gallic Wars. Yeah. And which we that's know just fact, extremely unlikely. Yeah. Uh, also, this, all of these ancient not, writers have a tendency to It's not defeated. He's just like, moving in reverse yeah. in many situations. It reminds, it reminds me, it reminds me of... Um, when I was younger, an old an old army colonel I spoke to, and he said, the, the British never retreat, we simply advance to the rear. Um, and it's, it's that exact same vibe. Exactly, like the, the whole, you know, it's not it's not a retreat, it's a tactical repositioning. Um, yes, the polar yeah. vibes of, sir, we're surrounded, good, then they have nowhere to run. <laughs> we can shoot in any direction then. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just the attitude you gotta have at a certain point, I guess. You know, you're, you're running into these situations like, battling screaming gauls in the forest what are you going to oh, yeah. do if not just you know when you're going through hell keep have, going right have you not a situation had... that you want to not to mention that when they first invaded uh, like the when they first invaded britain they were experiencing things that had not really been seen in most warfare mm -hmm. around the mediterranean for hundreds of years they were coming up against chariots yep which mind you is not necessarily a very hard thing to counter it really is not no. chariots overall if you look at it historically they mm. stuck mm -hmm. They were really only applicable for a very short amount of time in warfare because they are, even if you think, okay, these are things that as a heavy duty striking vessel capable of smashing an into an enemy line. Yeah, you get any number of people together, have them brace, mm -hmm. if, they're, if the whole chariot's going to fall apart. It only worked in warfare that was significantly more spread out. If you the moment it goes up against a heavy formation, it's going to go to shit. Yes. But considering that the horses that they had at the time in Britain, they were much smaller than what you'd seen on the mainland. So they were only useful for doing things like pulling carts and chariots. You couldn't really ride them into battle very easily. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, yeah. to be fair, going on about the chariots breaking against them tight formations easily is a little bit of a, a little bit of foreshadowing in a way. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, that's kind of the issue that we're going to run into later in this podcast. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you look at when chariots are most popular. We're talking about between you know they last into Britain for so long because nobody's fighting in heavy formations. You look at the Middle East; chariots are very popular until suddenly they're very much not. And it's yeah. you, you see a pretty solid uh, development of phalanx warfare in the Middle East that basically directly corresponds with the decline in chariot warfare, especially once mm. pikes got involved. I mean, no, nobody was going up against Alexander's forces with, with a chariot. Um, oh, God, no. The only time you'd have a chariot at that point is when you'd have a, a, a commander mm -hmm. that could effectively stand and do things. But you're not going to then send them into battle. That's no. effectively a mobile platform upon which the commander can issue orders from. Yep. Yeah. So when when Caesar's getting to Britain, he's encountering people on these things. Caesar's main... The, the way and they're made of wicker. They're mm -hmm. not even. They're not even like full on iron. They're not heavy duty no. vessels. These are light. Yeah, these, these are, are extremely light chariots. We're not talking about like the terrifying scythe chariots that the Persians had or are like supposed to have had. We're not talking about that. These are these are people with these are baskets with wheels, being yeah, ridden yeah, literally baskets with wheels. Being That's driven the best by way to ponies. Describe it. Being driven by ponies. These are not war horses as we think of them. These are not the the horses the Roman equestrians are riding. These are like British ponies. See, so, it, it, you know so... the you remember that statue that's in uh where where is it? It's in London, isn't it? It's the Bodica's statue Revenge, of Bodica. Right. Yes, I, yeah, I'm seeing it this weekend. <laughs> but yeah, Bodica's Revenge. If if anyone is curious about it, look it up, pull that thing up, and you see this statue. And at first, when you're thinking, man, the chariots that they had at this time, how terrifying and visceral this must have been. And you look at this and go, that is that is impressive. And then you look at the actual recreations that they have mm -hmm. of the chariots, and you're like, no, it, it seriously was a little basket yeah. with wheels pulled mm -hmm. by ponies. It is nowhere near as intimidating as what it looks like here, but it still was mm -hmm. surprising because even if these things were tiny, relatively speaking, they were still very nimble. At yeah. least that, they were light and nimble. And utterly horrifying if you're a light infantryman wearing basically no armor. Or oh yeah, send a bill take forward, uh, get just yoinked by a guy uh, <laughs> in skins. Yeah, it's... <laughs> riding by at 30 miles an hour on a well, chariot like... into the forest. 
what's most terrifying to me is you know the like i can't remember the name of them the horns that the the the, the britonic celts would have like came oh, up like a boar i can't remember the, the horns, exact name horns. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Horns? I, I, I think that's the name but the the sound that like, i don't know if you've ever like heard them in real life but in real life when you're in like it's it i i i i swear the air reverberates like it's it it's the most it's like because they're designed obviously that it's a war it's a war instrument it's designed to oh, to corns, make you feel that's what it was yeah. I, the car i i missed the, the card is when you bury people in rocks oh it, yeah. it, it the is the is the yeah. horn oh okay yeah yeah i was like where's the confusion here or the carrots those corns, things are terrifying corns, corns. yeah mm. okay. Imagine that coming towards you, and then the chariots come out of nowhere, mm -hmm. and then allegedly, maybe or maybe not, a bunch of naked guys start running towards you as well. And it's <laughs> oh, misty they as hell. You they have to remember, it's Britain shirtless. at this time. There's no lights. Everything is kind of misty and cool. Yep. And then out of the forest, because the entire thing is covered in forest, is just these half naked people on chariots that just. It's, it would be terrifying. It would. And I'm for amazed. the Roman soldiers, every single one of those people across the field from you man to man is a better soldier a better fighter than you every single yeah, right. one of them is more yeah. skilled with their weapon than you could ever hope to be because that's not how you were trained that was not the point of your training you were trained to move in a cohesive unit in a in a yep. wall a block of soldiers and go stab these guys are going to tear you apart if you break formation yep. but this this also leads into i've i've heard multiple people say this the, the roman conquest of britain is a real historical anomaly because unless you count the the system of that the Romans need triumphs, mm -hmm. um, it was like um, it was Cla yeah, it was Claudius that successfully invaded, wasn't it? Yeah. Like the, his whole thing was because after um, Caligula was assassinated, he needed to build um, political capital. Mm -hmm. Where do you, where do you conquer? We're not really having much fun in Germania no, at the moment. They were We've not got having parts fun in Germany. Oh no, um, God. <laughs> um, and and so where do we go? Oh well, we had we've got some allies in in Britain, and then boom, some some mm. Britonic Celt comes over and goes, "Oh, I've just been ousted as king." Oh well, I suppose we have to go and help you now. Yeah, <laughs> the, literally, like the they were looking for the most minor thing. Literally, yeah. Um, also, <laughs> that's basically Roman history summed up. Is oh oh, this little thing happened. Guess we have to conquer everything. Yeah, and you know, a, it's, it's a good it's point. It's only though. right. It's, yeah. a, it's a good point to bring up because if you look at what Augustus did in Germany, they had already conquered, they had conquered Africa a long time ago at this point. And when I say Africa, I mean the, the region of Africa. As North Africa. It, it North wouldn't Africa. have crossed the, uh, the Sahara here. No Though way. there was the one expedition yeah. that they did heading down into Ethiopia, but that was specifically in order to try and get control of the spice trade. And yeah. part, part yeah. of it worked. Most of it did not most um most. malaria uh, kind of malaria really ruined issue, a lot yeah. of things for him there yeah but they so they get you know they've got spain they've got africa they've got egypt they've got them uh they haven't got the middle east totally under their control yet but they're getting there um you know th they have turkey mm -hmm. i think at this point they might already have ponte caspia um, i mean there's there's yeah. not a ton left for rome to conquer outside of germany and the problem with germany is you know we look at it and we look at where they were fighting, and we're like, oh, guys, you almost had it. Like, <laughs> you weren't that far away. But they didn't know that, because they didn't have maps. <laughs> they Not to mention everything that they're going into at the time. You're talking about German forests it's it's, it's, it, and rivers. There's you're, you're going through the Rhineland, and in that region, where it's hills, forests, and rivers, mm -hmm. none of that is going to be easy to climb into. I, I mean, Ger Germany is Rome's Vietnam. It really is. It was. That's a good way to describe it. Yeah, I, I would argue it's worse. I, <laughs> I would because because not only not only did like they go in so like with Schuderberg, they they went in so so confident and then were betrayed by someone that mm -hmm. they thought was completely Romanized. And if you think about it, Rome's big achievement isn't the empire; it's um, religious unification and cultural unification. Mm. That's how Rome sustained itself. Yep. Right. So that losing someone who you believe is a romanized germanic person back to and i mean it fell apart and after Schuberg anyways and the romans did have a little bit of success yeah. well flavius but, managed to beat his own brother yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> but but i mean obviously i guess the the famous quote varus where are my legions yeah. you know like that is possibly, gone, bitch. yeah to this Hang day on. 
they they lost so hard that I know people in Germany that laugh to Italians to this day about Schutemer. <laughs> Italians didn't even exist yet. <laughs> Oh boy! Yeah, I, the the story of Arimnius and Flavius is like a, a phenomenal ancient tragedy of two brothers. <laughs> like, depends on your point of view, I suppose. <laughs> well, I just mean in terms of the relationship, like in, like a dramatic oh, yeah, tragedy. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, if you look at it, it's two brothers who were both basically kidnapped as children, raised to be Roman. One chose his own people. One chose his adoptive family. Like, mm. it's a pretty, it's a tragic story. It's very sad. It but, does actually play out in that case like a drama of what yeah. you would have anticipated. Yeah, it does sound yeah. Shakespearean. Yeah, it does. It's a great story. A uh, great song by the band Sire, uh, S-Y-R, called It Is To Be So, which is about that if you're uh, if you're interested in a very good piece of music. But, I love that there's more historical songs other than Sabaton. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Random, yeah. Random. S- Sire's great, um, especially for stuff regarding Britain. Uh, they have a lot of Celtic stuff. Um, they have a song called Legacy, which is uh, about about Rome. And about how the Romans have been expelled from Britain and they're never coming back, and it, your legacy is dust, basically. Um, it, well, right. like, your leg, your legacy is dust while the Celts still remain is the idea. Pretty based. Um, I mean that's part, part of my ancestry's um, um Celtic yeah. Gaelic. So. <laughs> yeah. But I, I want to circle back because what you said about uh the 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 causes belly here, the the reason for the war was that Rome made a few allies on the coast. I think it was uh, Demonia was one of them. Um, um, it was one of the uh, uh, Brigantes. Brigantes were to the north, for sure. I the, Brigantes. the Brigantes were way far to the north. Yeah. They were up near Scotland, no. weren't they? Oh, it began with a B. It was, it was, it was an, a, a Gallic... A Gallic, a Gallic? Belgica? That was it, Belgica, yeah. 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 I always get confused with with Gaelic and Gallic. You're all good. It's, they're, they're too close. So I was like, it was a Gallic tribe, but, but yeah. yeah, they fled from Gaul mm-hmm. um, after after like Julius Caesar came in, and then they allied the Romans, and they were like the spies. And I, when I, I when I first read that, I was like, this is the most confusing anime betrayal of like, hey guys, we've escaped from the Romans. By the way, we're Roman allies. <laughs> it's it's an interesting an interesting way of doing things, but you got to respect the hustle. At a certain oh, yeah, point, no. you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so Caesar, Caesar, when he first tries to go over from Gaul into Britain, his first reaction is, a, a lot of people, you know, might think that you're looking at Caesar going, oh, this is, this is just another Gaul. It's not. Caesar's reaction is, this place is weird. This place is very strange. They do very weird things here, and I don't like it. I don't want to be here. What, you mean said every Roman conqueror ever? Yeah. They do weird yeah. things here and I don't like it. I love conquered. I love the Wicker Man thing because I, I sit here and I'm like, come on, guys. That Does that make sense to you? <laughs> or yeah, does it, or does it cut maybe... off his nipples and throw him into a bog. That makes no sense. Yeah, that's a fair point. <laughs> like, here's the thing. As much, because obviously so many different things in history are exaggerated, and I have to say that time and time again, but when it comes to people exaggerating stuff in history, you don't even necessarily need to do so, because the stuff that already has happened in history is so incredibly Mm -hmm. weird. Yeah. It is. It is. So, I mean, as much as we look at something and go, there's no way that happened. Maybe. Yeah. We we don't know. I guess it's Considering the other stuff. We don't know. Or stuff could have occurred as, like, a larger event that was, um... Like, let's say there's even the concept of the Wicker Man. My personal thought on that mm-hmm. is that it's not something that potentially would happen every year. Or that it's it something that could necessarily be... people in it. Yeah, or that it could. it's something that could happen over time period or as a sacrifice of mm-hmm. more prisoners versus, yeah. you know, hey, we're going to sacrifice a whole bunch of our own people. Yeah. It, it, it makes more logical sense in that scenario. But yeah. you never know. You and never also, do. It's also important to remember that with the Romans, human sacrifice was detestable. That was yes. something that... Yep. wasn't necessarily yep. detestable to the Gauls and the Germans and the Britons and the uh, Carthaginians actually would sacrifice infants. Um, yeah, these guys didn't even cut open chickens and throw their intestines into a pot and dance around with it. Freaking barbarians, man. <laughs> Freaking barbarians! They don't ask the sheep if we should attack by slicing its throat. Exactly. Like, um, how inhumane are these people? <laughs> It's it's a relative level of degeneracy, if we're being realistic <laughs> here. 
I know, and just I'm reminded of the story again mm-hmm. from the war with Carthage yeah. and what happened to the um the Oracle chickens mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that they were killed because of the commander that was like, screw you for giving me a bad omen. We're not mm-hmm. gonna do this. Kills the chickens, loses the battle, becomes a literal war criminal, an enemy of the state because he killed the agents of the gods, the chickens. Now you know where Bethesda got the idea for the opening chicken in Skyrim. <laughs> Oh uh, man, I just some of the some of the stuff that's happened. The Dutch <laughs> ate their prime minister. I'm gonna throw that in before we move on. The Dutch ate their prime minister, and that's my favorite historical fact. Sorry. Yeah. They did. <laughs> I like that. There's two defenestrations of Prague. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> mm-hmm. If I had a nickel for every time nobles were thrown out of a window in Prague, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Yeah, um, I, I love that both of the, the both of the weird things that first came to her head had to do with nobles being hurt in some yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of nobles being hurt in some way, <laughs> when I, I want to finally, I want to really dig into the Boudicca part for the last twenty or so. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. The um, thing that was supposed to be the whole purpose of yeah. this from the first. Well, place. It's, yeah, we absolutely. talked about Rome for the first half, which you needed to talk yeah. about Rome to get what's going on here. But so. Yeah. Caesar basically looks at Britain and goes, there's too much, in my opinion at least, probably went, there's too much potential for me to lose here. Um, his main reasoning yeah. is, ah, there's there's nothing. This, this, the, an invasion wouldn't be worth it. It's just not worth it. I think Caesar probably went, this is logistically way harder than Gaul. And, and was like, I have Gaul, I can come back for this, but I'm, yeah. I'm going, I'm going home. Collecting my laurels, getting my triumph. I'm I'm going through it. He had time. Also, yeah. I want to really quickly. Somebody uh, did send in a twenty dollars super chat, and as I said earlier, we will get we will answer those as they come in. Yeah. And uh, Gomb or Ben Krajniak said, just popping in to say that the Roman Empire was clearly created to cover up the fact that Nero was a Wendussi. Also, Aiden, when is the Halloween sexy calendar going to be available for purchase? We have been trying to find a photographer for the sexy calendar. Um. Currently, it's very expensive to find a photographer for the sexy calendar. The only I, photographer I know who's going to do it for a low price is my ex. For the first time? Oh, you didn't know about this? No, I didn't know about this. What are you talking about with the sexy calendar? Oh, what, Aiden what, what and I, I, uh, so Wendigoon basically paid for Aiden and I to make a sexy calendar because he thought it would torture us, and he was right. It was one of our old donation goals that we still have to get to. Um, yep. Fun. Fun fun times for all. But yeah, so Rome invades. Because Claudius needs something. The complete speech. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> Claudius needs something to bolster his reputation so that he doesn't get assassinated himself. Claudius decides to invade Britain because Britain's basically all that's left to conquer. Claudius yeah, is still accessible and able to be reached. Exactly. Without marching over land constantly. Yeah. So Claudius gets there and he needs a reason to be there. Obviously, he gets it from, you know, a random tribe that just recently decided to be friends, but Claudius needs an in, so he gets it. Uh, he marches into Britain and very quickly succeeds at conquering a whole bunch of people. I don't think it was Claudius himself that was doing it, right? No, no he shows up, though. Yeah. He shows up for, he like, up the end. two weeks, right? Hold on, no, no. I know, I remember there was something funny about this, that he, he only showed up, like, at the last second of it to claim glory. What was yeah. it? He marked, to my knowledge, he 16 marked... 16 days! Yeah. <laughs> he was only there 16 days, and then would take credit, uh, like, complete credit for it and march back and try it. Didn't, yeah. didn't he, um, didn't he, uh, I, I can't remember the Roman name for it, but didn't he just rock up in Colchester, do a little parade, and be like, okay, cool, I'm your emperor now, um, so it's cold here, bye. Uh... <laughs> you say it's cold here? Yeah, the, the, Britain is most of the time it's very very cold. Really, cold, Especially foggy, comparison. and rainy. Oh, yeah, cold, like, you foggy and rainy. Think where it is in position, you know that the only reason why Britain even has the climate that it does is it's specifically the, from the warm currents the that thing. come out of like the Gulf. Yeah. yeah, if it wasn't for that, Britain, which is already naturally cold, would be a almost like an ice rock. It yeah, would I, basically be Norway. I I knew that that's the thing is I knew it was like 
I, I knew it was warmer than everywhere else around it, so it was like that's why I was like surprised to hear you describe it as cold. It's because I was thinking relatively relative. speaking, that's yeah. it, it, it's relative. Relative to us, it's probably very cold. Oh yeah, especially in comparison to my ninety-four degree garage right now, which is why I'm in here. <laughs> yeah, Ryan, you want some heat? Uh, what? I'm, in America, I'm... that can mean two things. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm far, I'm far <laughs> too ginger. I know I, I know what the other thing. Is. But I'm 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 far too ginger to have any more heat. This, this is enough for me. Oh. I I fry in the winter sun. Uh. Oh boy. So, so hey, they're not Hadrian. Hadrian's later. Claudius. A lot later. <laughs> Claudius gets everything conquered, but there's a little bit of a problem, and that problem is that even when the Romans make decisions and they make good decisions at a policy level, uh, they don't always make great decisions at the enforcement level, and so, Boudica is the queen of the Iceni. And Ryan, do you do you uh, want to walk us through how we got from things are chill yes. to things are not chill? Um so this is uh this this bugs me more than anything else in history because so um B Boudicca's wife uh, wife Boudicca's <laughs> husband um Boudicca's husband, yes, things were far more progressive in ancient times. Uh, they Boudicca's actually husband, were in uh, no, yeah, actually, in yeah. Britain and Ireland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, was best, yeah. Um, that joke has more truth to it. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, so Boudicca's husband, um, whose name eludes me, Pragus is Prag something or other, isn't it? Uh, Prasitagus. That's that's which the is one. just certainly um, not what his name was. <laughs> oh yeah, no, <laughs> there's no way any of us are going to pronounce definitely it. not that. <laughs> People in the UK, I don't know if it's the same. His name was uh, Clem Federpool Powingle Go Go Go. <laughs> That's that's a Welsh city you just named. Uh, <laughs> I know it is. <laughs> um, I can uh, probably make any number of consonant sounds and name a Welsh city. Yeah. <laughs> For the record, there is a Welsh flag in the studio. <laughs> yeah, just uh, yeah, you saw the cancellation coming then. Um, right, but anyway, so her her husband was a Roman ally, and so he very smartly saw the winds of change coming obviously but the romans by this time had been loaning all of the the britonic celtic tribes um loads of money and they're like well we don't we don't we don't do this and they're like cool well you can pay us back and do taxes and stuff and um so he was the husband was like ah oh, there's no way we're gonna beat this now but like we we, we lost our chance we should have come together and just absolutely smashed mm -hmm. them a lot harder we've, we've missed the chance so he goes, tell you what, Mr. Nice Romans, um, that who totally aren't going around conquering everyone, you definitely live up to this deal. I'm going to give you half of my kingdom, right? And my wife and daughters will inherit the other half. And you can like co-inhabit for a bit. And then like eventually they'll be Romanized and they'll all be hunky-dory. And the Romans go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. We've but never nah. gone back on a yeah, <laughs> we've never gone back on a deal ever. Never. Until the Romans go, hey, you know we made you take the money. Would you like to now pay that back? And when the when Boudicca goes, well, not really. My husband's just died. Well, let me sort some things. Oh, okay, you're you're raiding everything and burning. But no, I'm not paying your taxes. I'm not repaying your loan. And then mm. they do some things to Boudicca and her daughters that I'm not going to say on YouTube because yep. we will get banned. But they're very, very evil. And if, if you have a stronger stomach, you can go and look them up. I don't recommend you do. Kings and um, generals, thing Kings and generals has a King, solid. If you want to, if you want to yeah. look up anything that is like that, K yeah. Kings and Generals has a fantastic like yes. twenty minute video on Boudicca and infographics. I believe yeah. Kings and Generals and infographics are very like good summaries on that. Um, and so most people at this point would just be like, "Sod it, I'm you know I'm, I'm that that like I'm done." Um, Boudicca goes, "Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna raise an absolute rebellion," and of course mm -hmm. um, I believe it's. Paulinus at the time he's off campaigning in in um in in Cumbri, in Wales at this point he's um trying to take out the druids um which he would sadly be fairly successful on um but also <laughs> like so... take out the druids is such a weird term <laughs> like a weird phrase we got to take, out, the take, take, take we gotta, we gotta out crush them before they can use their <laughs> their animal magic on us <laughs> take <laughs> someone out yeah. the 80s <laughs> movies of the roman brother <laughs> The um, Romans are putting potions in the water and trying to freak the frogs gay. Which, but the, the 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 loss of the druids is so sad because they refused to write anything down or share it. We lost possibly thousands of years of knowledge in one foul swoop. Mm -hmm. um, which I understand why they would keep that um, 
a secret, but 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 that moment allowed Bodica to come down to um to, to oh, oh, this is where I'll leave it off. Um to, to Colchester, which is actually not that far from me. I'm I'm very lucky to be mm. near Colchester, London, and St. Albans. Mm. Um these well, are all very familiar from uh Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Oh, yeah. Been <laughs> yeah. to all of these places in the last week. Totally. <laughs> I, I've I've been to I've been to two of them regularly for the last yeah, twenty five years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I am sitting so small ones this weekend. Um, but uh, well, what did she do at Colchester, Ryan? Well, in what Colchester, happened to Colchester? She turns up. Um, obviously, there's no one to defend it. So there's a few loyal, like the, bearing in mind, Colchester was a very important Celtic city. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a few retired, um, like legionaries who are like Roman soldiers who are just chilling out there and they're enjoying their for some reason they decided to retire in britain um and they're enjoying their retirement and then all of a sudden they see a massive celtic army come and they go yeah we're dead but to their credit they bravely defend everyone mm -hmm. and now obviously i i like Bodica. I'm, I'm a very big defender of st elgar of kiev and stuff so i would this be a, a hypocrite pretty, to this is a pretty yeah. rough thing to defend it, what you're about to defend i'm oh, not yeah. gonna no, yeah. i'm not gonna defend it i'm gonna say i i'm like in history she did what was called a pro gamer move yeah in in history in history there are moments where you go i understand but it is you know but i i, I did do it recently do a video on st olga where i was gushing over her so yeah. I i'm a hypocrite if i completely flat out have a go at Bodega here but so um everyone hides in like uh, i can't remember which god this temple was built to but they all hide in the main temple in colchester um and <laughs> she burns them everyone alive in it mm -hmm. um there is a layer of like she burned Colchester so thoroughly um that there is a layer of destruction. Yep. Uh and this then repeats in London, in Londinium as it was at the time. That's uh and then much smaller city at the time, by the way. Yeah, oh yeah, like, yeah. It was a considerably yeah. smaller city, city that people yeah, don't like think Colchester about it was the Roman capital mm. at this point. When Colchester, but when in fact, um, I, I believe Paulinus does get down. If I am getting his name wrong, I do apologize. I believe he gets down at this point and he's like, I'm gonna come defend. Um, and then he goes, Oh, maybe not, and he legs it and he abandons the, mm. the city of London to its fate. London is burnt even heavier than colchester because yeah. colchester was the capital at that point and it still had some significance to the celts a lot of people i've had so many really cringe takes from this where people are like, oh the, the romans deserved it because they were conquerors do you know how many celts were in those cities at the same time mm -hmm. because a lot of celts saw the winds of change and sided with the romans who was farming the fields and feeding the romans and who was all burned yeah. alongside the majority of the population was celtic yeah it wasn't it wasn't actually people think the romans came over in droves there was a roman um ruling elite but most of the people in the cities mm -hmm. were still celtic in colchester she crucified a large chunk of people which yep. she did learn from the romans to be fair yeah but you know <laughs> I was gonna say... as, as my parents said to my brothers when we were younger you know um six of one half dozen of the mm -hmm. other like <laughs> two wrongs don't make a right but then she finishes off and um, chases after paul and this and he luckily the citizens of rulium or st albans as it is known today um they sort of caught on as like why is the roman legion why are they why are they going very yeah. fast maybe we should pick up and we know that st albans had the least amount of death because of the coin content so when they mm -hmm. dig it up there's more coins in the layers where people had been killed on so much mass that there's just coins everywhere mm -hmm. and this is how they figured out the death toll and st albans but st albans was so thoroughly destroyed um when i go visit this weekend i was like oh what cool roman stuff i got um so there's a wall it's called St. Albans Roman Wall, <laughs> and that's a tourist attraction because <laughs> St. Albans was eviscerated again. I can only imagine it's because Boudicca got there and was like, "There's, there's no one to kill." I'm, I'm, I'm kind of mad about that. I've been enjoying, like, because, and I'll, I'll finish off and I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on for, for, for Watling Street, because um, she killed seventy thousand people yeah. in London alone, and it's. Uh, there are some hardcore defenders of Bodica, and yes, I understand rebellion. Yes, she was going against uh, a, a that wasn't a rebellion. That was a cleansing. Was what yeah. she wanted. She wanted yeah. a removal yeah. of Rome as a concept. Yeah, like I say I understand the logic behind it, but it's still a bad thing she, to do. She she hit him with the Roma Delenda est. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Was, was Uno none reversed. of that. But yeah, I will Uno say that there were, um, I believe it was Severus that would uh, do a very similar reaction to 
a, a not a picture uh the caledonians who were the more southern tribes mm-hmm. below the picts like the the caledonians were gone that's why we know more about the picts than the caledonians sorry they, they <laughs> slight were, tangent there they they did not love uh letting rebellious groups of people live um but it does i do wonder looking at this and seeing kind of the disparity in reaction here on the one hand Boudica and her daughters were uh violated violated in an, ex- an extraordinary way um yeah. horrible oh, yeah. horrible things happen to them as individuals i have a hard time believing although i could believe but i'm i'm in, i'm inclined to question the narrative that all the romans did was a little bit of burning crops and uh assaulting women. oh Oh, they burned down settlements. No, I'm like hundred yeah. percent. When they went oh, in, all over the place. No, they, they absolutely did. That was a regular thing that was done. Like you destroy one in order to make sure that the next one after it does not fight back That's, as yeah. hard. Like that was kind of the whole point. It's exactly. similar to what the yeah. Mongols had done in history. The Romans would make examples of people yeah. all the time. I just, I just didn't case. want to give anybody the impression that like oh, yeah. the Celts were committing genocide out of nowhere. Yeah, the Roman. Yeah, yeah. And like for the stories, the, what we're gonna even gonna be talking about, I'm sure once it gets to how this all actually ends, mm-hmm. the baggage train filled with all the women and children that yeah. were following the army. Yeah, this gets yeah. They, they yeah. didn't escape. So, Stephen, do you do you know the story? Well, I know the story, like with the Battle of yes. Watling Street. Yeah, it's Watling. What Watling was Watling. it Watling or Watling? Watling. 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 Yeah. Watling, so the yeah. Battle of Watling there. So from how it all plays out, once they're actually funneled into this territory, that. They still don't know to this day exactly where this is. They mm-hmm. have a general idea of the area, but we have no idea what the specific battlefield in which all this takes mm. place in. But the, the the idea was is that it the overwhelming numbers of the Britons were condensed into an area where mm. they weren't going to be as useful because do you, the Romans. Do you want me to position... give the geography really quick? Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah, sure. So what the Romans did is they retreated, I believe it was south of Watling Street. Um, and I, so they retreated up onto a hill and the way that this worked out was that the Britons, despite having a force of some 200,000, supposedly, which I'll, I'll say from the beginning, that's, that's utter. Yeah. It's probably bullshit. not. That's probably that, the, that's that if that is a real number, it's the total number of Britons present on that day, not the total number of Britons <laughs> gearing up for war, but still the Romans were probably talking about what? 10,000, 12,000. They were about 10,000. Yeah. yeah. So the Romans, and it is accepted that the Britons had far superior, superior numbers, numbers, at least three or four times the amount. Yeah. So we're still talking about massively outnumbered here. So what the Romans do is what they always do. They use the terrain and their discipline to their advantage. And they pull back onto a hillside and make it so that the only thing that Boudicca can do is send her forces into what is essentially a fatal funnel. So the Romans have condensed the battlefield. The Britons, despite being mass- massively outnumbering the Romans can only either split their forces and try and go around or make a frontal assault. And our frontal assault with lightly armed troops in formation means that they get immediately peppered by javelins and skewered. And then once they actually reach the front lines, then you have the very famous Roman teamwork where teamwork makes a dream work Mm -hmm. and dream work is a freaking nightmare for the Britons. Yes. And that's, uh, that, that, that's where they just start getting cut down rapidly. Mm -hmm. Can, can I make a very controversial argument here? Oh boy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Boudicca was only successful when there was no major Roman resistance. Overall, she was actually a very bad rebel leader. Oh, that's not... That oh, she was not a terrible general. Terrible general. Like, I, I've I've said that to some people and they've got very upset with me <laughs> before. Well, I mean, it's, it's just objectively true. You look at the battles yeah. she won, she had thousands and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands... And like, what was what was defending Colchester? A few hundred, and like um, it was it's about, about two hundred. Yeah, a couple hundred. The, a couple hundred. Like is a thousand. Yeah, a couple hundred. Uh-huh. And it was it even was it even actual legionaries or was it? Veterans? No, they were they were they were they were, ve- they were retired veterans. Yeah, yeah, yeah they were the thought. ones who had been given the yeah. land after serving yeah. their time. So Which, yeah, it was to, basically two hundred for a garrison. To be fair, that is part of why Rome did that exact thing of settling veterans on the frontier. Yeah, because if so it's your you land, we're going to quickly muster. You quickly muster an out of shape but very professional army, um, yep. if absolutely necessary. And on occasions like this, it certainly was. But the the way that this all progresses, you make a great point. She's not a good military commander. She she's had a, she's a very good like mm-hmm. speech and like yeah. person to immobilize, but she just mm-hmm. no military experience. She had 
the terrain advantage. It was Britain. She had the supply lines. Rome did not. They were on a hill. She had more men. They could easily have set up a perimeter, waited like three days, and the Romans would have been dying of thirst. Yep. They're... She could have she could have pulled back. If she had pulled back, bearing in mind Nero at this point wants to pull out of Britain, to my knowledge. Nero is like, because it's not really his, if he pulls out, he can just, the Roman Empire. No, it was because it was a drain. At... Yeah. Britain for the longest time. It, people gave me so much shit for this. I, it, no, it's it's weird that I got, when I explained the economic system mm -hmm. of ancient Rome and the contradictions of its empire building at times, as to why Britain was not conquered because it was wealthy. Oh no, of course they wanted to take Britain because it had all of the tin supplies. Yeah, tin was valuable. Tin was of course, they really needed it because they needed it for like for the bronze production for other things. Like yes, they did need this metal, but overall Britain was a net loss on the Roman books. If you look at the at the actual cost of it, it it cost significantly more in taxes to like militarily defend it and pacify the population than it extracted in terms of wealth. Mm -hmm. Egypt, on the other hand, was the polar opposite. At one point in time, Egypt was responsible for around 40% of the entire Roman annual budget. Yep. In terms of grain and trade value that went through there from trade with India, it was easily the most valuable province mm -hmm. out of all of them, even more than the home of, like Italia. Yep. And, yep. and Britain was a drain to the point that exactly as you said, Nero was like, I don't want to be here anymore. We probably should leave. And then this happens. If it had gone even slightly better for the Britons, they would have pulled out. If, if, she, had, if she had retreated, I mean, there's, there's a point in the battle there, because obviously when the Romans start to advance, when they start, when they've realized they've taken out enough Celts and they're, they're, they're starting to, um, like their morale is starting to wane. There is a point in that battle as the Romans pull out where they have to spread out if Boudicca had pulled back her cavalry, just, just all she had to do is pull back her cavalry and then let the, the main like foot soldiers fall back, back to the baggage train and then the Romans are going to be enveloped and then just pull in the cavalry from the rear. She could have salvaged that battle even at the last possible moment. But no, she just puts her chariots, which are known for being mobile and very successful against underprepared Roman troops, just stagnant. Mm -hmm. I, I've clearly played too, far too much Total War and Crusader Kings to. to... Oh, no, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's. it's well, I know exactly what you're talking about there. Yeah, there, wasn't there also a Roman general that was in like Devon that was refusing to join in the main battle? I, I saw this on um, sure. Kings Generals. There was there was like he he was like he had like another contingent. I can't remember his name. It was either in Devon or Cornwall. I Not cannot sure. remember. For the life of me, I cannot remember. But, but he he like ended up um self-deleting youtube uh he ended up self-deleting because he knew when paul and one he was screwed but like mm. but the, the the whole setup the reason i bring it up is because to my knowledge the whole setup was paul and us all lose somehow we can blame him pull out of britain and then we ain't got to spend all the money mm -hmm. except, i say in the most essex accent ever <laughs> except there wasn't much of a chance of losing if you look at their actual battle tactics I mean, I... it's just if you change a couple of Bodica's tactics in that battle and she wins. Is, yeah, it, but that's it, the thing, is like... Th th it's very obvious going into it that there was yeah. no actual tactical or yeah. leadership skill yeah. into it. Yeah. The it, only it, thing that she had, and I will say this, she did have this, was righteous mm -hmm. anger. Yeah. And that righteous anger invigorated a lot of the population to have them follow her, but she had, and, and while she was an orator to be able to stir them up into action, she, she didn't have any of the skill then to back it up to actually utilize anything. It's one of those reasons why, and I've gotten some shit for this before, and I've said this in the past, for exactly as we say, she wasn't an actual good military commander, and I just find it funny how much of a legendary status that she has in the modern day, because she is a symbol. She is a symbol of, like, yeah. female power, of heroism, of rebellion and strength. Like, she is all of these things in one. And, like, yeah, she was a rebel. Do you, do you know where that but modern image comes from? Of uh, the Victorian era, because yep. you, because specifically you had Queen Victoria. Yeah, yeah, you had the British Empire and you had a female monarch, the longest reigning female monarch in British yep. history. So of course they're like, yeah, here's this other also powerful woman from our history. We 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 got this going back centuries, at millennia the time, even at the time. Yep. Ryan, she was the longest reigning. Yeah, yeah at, at the time. Yeah, Elizabeth, yeah, Elizabeth II. II is now. But um, 
but uh, uh, doesn't also Bodic Bodic's name I swear means victory as well in, in some way. Yeah. Yeah, it, I think it means like I, victory bringer or something like that. That is but, yeah. ironic. Yeah, the the fact that there the fact there that she an... the fact that she initiated that battle proves that she was never going to win. Yeah. Because yeah. even if she had managed to win that battle at the extensive losses she would have incurred, At word would have spread. Long. Resistance to Roman rule would have absolutely crumbled, knowing they lost that many to take out one Roman legion. When there's that many more Roman legions, like the the, the morale breaking would have been would have been enough to end Britain it, right there. There's also the possibility at that point that even if Nero goes and actually pulls out of it, that Nero disappears. Next guy goes, well, clearly that previous emperor, who we all hate him, obviously, because everyone came to hate Nero. So yep. that previous guy was wrong. We should never have done this. And they're going to send a new legion in literally a couple years later, do the exact same thing. And then they're going to fold. Yep. It's just going to repeat the cycle. Yep. It's, yep. Um, it's just so it's so frustrating looking back at people in history, knowing everything we know now and just being like, you, you idiots. You stupid, yeah. silly people! Like I even, uh, I even realize the advantage I have when I'm playing a game like Total War or something of knowing the map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it's a <laughs> crucial thing of like just understanding tactical positioning of knowing where something is. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, yeah, I know that if I position this over at this time, then this thing is going to happen in this year. So I'll just be able to take advantage of it. It's a very easy thing. It's why it's it's going to sound dumb, but in front of the exact same note. I knew, hmm, you know, playing Medieval 2 Total War, I'm playing as England up here. I need to make sure that I have an army down here in the south because I know that a crusade is going to get called yep. right around this point, and I need to have my troops ready to move. Mm -hmm. yes. In fact, you know what? I'm going to start sending them down south anyway, and I'm just going to join the crusade when I'm already past the Strait of Gibraltar. So this is <laughs> this is where I prefer um, crusade, like most parents, like, because I've never been a big time. I'm, I'm very much real time. I don't like turn-based. Um... And this is where I like Crusader Kings over because I don't, you, especially with Crusader, you get it with Hoi 4, you get the, the obviously you can put historical AI. With Crusader Kings, it goes wild. Like my, yeah. my favorite oh, campaign yeah. in CK2, not CK3, CK3 is getting there. I do like CK3, but CK2, my favorite campaign, um, the Umads never lost in Iberia and they got very, very powerful. And if I was trying to build up England and I was like just about getting Scotland and then they declared on me. And I knew I was screwed. And so what I did, it was very similar to you putting an army in the south. Because every time they landed, because they didn't have enough boats, they just got hammered for like the landing disadvantage. Point. And Point. each time you know, they exactly landed Exactly as army. the Britons could have done to the Romans and almost did several times and then yep. just didn't strike. Yep. I, I, okay, to be fair, <laughs> Celtic Britons not attacking when they have the opportunity to seize a victory yeah. becomes a very common thing. Yeah, they are very, I, it's, it they might are very be a cultural clothed, difference right. between them and the Romans, but there are a number of occasions where you look at the Celts and you're like, "Why? They could have done this. Like they did. They their King Gedrix actually had like two hundred thousand men. Yeah, and he the, lost. They, the, thing, they, the thing is, and he Celts wasn't an idiot. He was not a he was not a bad commander like Boudica. Their King Gedrix was a good, well, a decent commander. He wasn't yeah, was Caesar, <laughs> but I mean, this is a guy who. Decent commander, battle tested, knew what he was doing, still lost to Rome because for some reason they didn't understand the concept well, of surrounding risky. the smaller army. Like, yeah, oh, just surround them. Just oh, oh, so the siege of Elysia is probably one of the most horrific moments in history. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> have you guys uh, listened to Dan Carlin's uh, hardcore history at all? No, Actually, no. But he it, has, it's been funny how many times I've been told to, he has, to either listen to it or that I it sounds similar yeah. for some things. But you yeah, guys, no. you guys do have not dissimilar voices. Um, yeah, I could hear it, but his <laughs> I, I don't I, I don't love all his stuff just because you know for some of it it's like a lot of it's focused on World War II, um, which has just for me been beaten to death by school. So what the thing that every single yeah. person momentarily getting into history covers. Yeah. yeah. But he does have a really good, like four hour long podcast called the Celtic Holocaust. That's all about Verkin Gedrix and Caesar. It's I mean, it's really good. Really it's good. a heavy name, but it's not, this It's not inaccurate. It's to not be inaccurate. Um, that's, that's about what you could, uh, but, the, that, that's about what you have to call them. But with that said, it is eight Oh four, which means we need to switch over to super chats. Ah, yes, yes. 
Uh, Bodica, cool, but also simultaneous. Uh, did a lot of crime and sucked at leading. Um, close. Bodica to me is a very similar figure, um, like a very similar story to Saint Olga of Kiev, and it just shows you how. Bring in mind, Saint Olga had far fewer numbers. Um, uh, right, and, and I believe you have a video. Also I believe you have a video yeah. on Saint Olga of Kiev. Yes, yes, I have. I have do, two videos. Do you want to really quickly tell people where they might find <laughs> your video on Saint Olga of um, Kiev? Um, you can find that on the History Daddy YouTube channel. Um, literally just history, history daddy, and then you've got a, a picture of a mustache. And um, I go over the first video. I go over her, um, her very similar way, similar situation to Bodica, where she goes in and she's taking out the the murderers of her husband. Um, <clears throat> and then the part two is her journey to sainthood and how the Eastern Roman Emperor Constantine the Seventh was desperate to get in her pants, um, and it backfired massively. And all he did was completely changed the religious landscape well all, it's all down to St. Olga actually um, it completely changed the religious landscape of Eastern Europe yeah, um, but yeah that's all on the yeah and also if you want any um, short bites of that it's all on TikTok and Instagram reels yeah. as well but it's uh, yeah it's all on history that YouTube can yeah I'll say just in the end it really is easy to change the religious scope of the landscape when you've murdered all the other people yeah, of the opposing religion <laughs> I'm not which sure. you didn't which is Historically speaking, I mean, that's basically what happens with fair. every religion, <laughs> including atheism. Like, even to when there's fair. not a religion, the the not religion is like, mm, no, I can't have this. <laughs> Stalin, Stalin burning Buddhist Stalin text, now, like. like... <laughs> <laughs> but no, to be to be to be fair to Saint Olga, she didn't kill everyone; she enslaved some of them. Oh, oh yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> you know, at least there was only that. Pro gamer moves. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Switching over to Super Chats, for those who maybe have not seen a Lore Lodge podcast before, the way we do question and answer time is we take half an hour at the end of the show, 8 to 8.30 p.m., to answer questions, obviously, but we answer the Super Chats first because those people paid to have their questions answered, and if there's too many, then we pick the ones that are most relevant to the topic at hand. Uh, so, with that said, if you have questions and you want to make sure they get answered, the best way you can do that is to Super Chat right here in the YouTube format. Uh, otherwise, uh, after we get through those, if we get through all of those, then I'll go through and I'll look for some more questions. Um, you guys are welcome to go scroll through looking for questions as well if you want. Uh, but we already got Ben's, so the second one was Gabe24 for $5, who said, I just got back from celebrating my birthday with my girlfriend, and I see you gents are live. Thank you guys for all you do. Keep up the great work. Well, happy birthday to you, and thank you for watching us on your birthday. That's like... It's a treat. Yeah. Happy birthday, man. <laughs> Happy <feel> birthday. Special. <laughs> yeah, I know. Here we're going to learn about war crimes and laugh. Oh, ho. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the new IKB 4472. By the way, is it really a war crime if the Geneva Convention hadn't happened yet? Um, nah, no, no, it's not right. a war crime if you're Canadian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they really, you know what? Was doing some research on, uh, on the Algonquin tribe today. That is Canada's reaction to most things. Uh, <laughs> It's not a war crime if you're not us. Hey, everyone in chat, go Google what they used to do with the food and the grenades. Oh, uh, um, don't, yeah, don't so Google that. Don't Google that. The, the new IKB 4472 for five pounds said, after what the Romans did to her and her children, I fully understand Boudicca's response. Condone, maybe not, but understand absolutely. Yeah. I yeah. yeah. And that's the point that everyone says. It's like at that point, she is she's not even human. She's a spirit of vengeance. That's yeah. the entire yeah. purpose. I don't think she ever had any intention of surviving that. Uh, that, is, was, that was just rage. I'm pretty sure her main he plan is, was to kill as many Romans as she could. She is Celtic Frank Castle at that point. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. The new IKB 4472 for 10 pounds this time said the rise of Boudicca as a propaganda image began with Elizabeth I, needed a strong female leader as a propaganda image, and the risk of invasion was very real. See, that's one of the things that it, it doesn't become more common, though, until going into the 19th century, though. Hmm. Like, yes, you start to see that in some circles, then, hmm. so he does have a point. But primarily, you see it rise into the 19th century because this is when more of the monetary capability is there within the British Empire to hmm. actually create more of these monuments and profess hmm. more of these things because it's going into the 1800s that you really see the gentlemanly class start to spread all of this knowledge around of how enlightened and powerful they were. And in that, it goes back to our ancient and powerful grand history. And it just, it, that, that's where you start to see like the statues and everything of Boudicca come into play. Which is a little funny considering that Boudicca would not have seen the English remotely 
as her people. It's also <laughs> funny that it's an it's an empire that was also very much trying to do a Roman thing on a global scale. <laughs> there's all hey, there's... semantics. Semantics. <laughs> history is history is everything and ironic. No, anything but ironic. Yeah, history is very ironic. Yeah. Field. Um, let's see, Zero Hour sent their member super chat. If you are a member of the channel, you do get a free super chat every month, I believe. Um, and said, shout out from Malvern this week. How y'all doing? Damn, Malvern. That's like, that way. Not that far. If it's oh, the same you're saying that way, for anyone that is listening into right now, they have no idea what the hell you're talking about. If they're behind Good. your board, if they're laminated inside of the wall, then we'd know. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I've got several corpses laminated inside of the wall. Oh, good to know. Good yeah. to know. I'm, Come on, man, it's the lore lodge. Right yeah. <laughs> one's sticking out right now in the top left. Yeah, I'm. A I'm actually. I'm actually in the walls right now. That is where Aiden keeps. Oh, me. Ruby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very nice. Ruby walls. Yeah. Um. All right. So let's see. Just gonna start scrolling through some of these. Uh, some of these chats, looking for questions. Did either you see one that you liked? Um. I did have a quick skim earlier. I, I to be fair, I actually I can't remember who said it and 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 I apologize. Um someone did say so they basically they were adventurers and they all took arrows to the knee. Um which I which I, which made me chuckle. We made a few Skyrim references in last week's video. People liked it. Um Skyrim <laughs> references always seem to play well with the audience. Um so a few people did ask where other Aiden is. Uh History Hut is just not a not a show where we had space <laughs> um, and it's also yet another thing for him to have to do every week <laughs> so no he uh he is actually currently at home editing uh tomorrow's video i believe oh um, excellent yeah we chose to stick with uh just steven and i as co-hosts for this one so that we didn't have too many hosts um, i also i thought i see think i see another uh 20 one that came in justin hoff at the bottom oh yes yeah what I, uh, there, there's another one at the bottom of the oh, chat. yeah, you are yeah. correct. Um, Justin Hoff for 20 said, stuck in 90 plus heat with no power, and this made my day. Great podcast today. Thank you. Oh. I'm sorry about your situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I just say that I, I empathize with you yeah. on a fundamental level, Justin Hoff. I, I'm not going to toot my own horn of anything of telling people like, hey, go and watch any of my videos. But if you actually go and look at the previous video that I put out on my history page, the History of Everything podcast, uh, I made a horrible mistake of going out there and recording a video in a light yellow shirt. And I look as though I have been pulled straight out of a grease can from the 1950s. <laughs> <laughs> it looks awful. Like when I was going back to edit that later, I just looked at this and went, damn, this is going to require so many more videos and photos to be placed over my image because I straight up look like a greased pig. Uh, I mean, we all have one of those, right? Every now and then. Hey, we put out a video just... recently mm. where there's a piece of white fuzz in my beard for the first 20 minutes. I've had that before. It's so ad you, you, as you're editing it, you cannot help but look at it the entire time. It's it's driving me. As I watched the premiere, I was just there like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Why didn't Aiden say anything? Oh, no one else noticed it. No one else noticed yeah. Only you did as you're watching it. I've had that Oh, no. Time. Everybody in the comments noticed. Uh, uh, everybody <laughs> noticed. And then, um, I don't end up, you, and then you don't end up catching anything until later. Or like when you start util utilizing a green screen and you didn't know that, hey, on the page that I had everything set up, it looked fine. But then the moment that you slightly change the color in another thing to bring up something else that you need behind you, and all of a sudden, half of it is just this fuzzy little trail that's running <laughs> down your back. I, I hate it. It's so frustrating. Oh, uh, Let's see. What else do we have here? Just scroll. I'm not, I'm not seeing. Yeah, not a lot of questions in the chat today. It's, no, it's, it's mostly it's, comments with people talking yeah. about heat. I've seen a lot of stuff <laughs> of people talking about heat and Skyrim. Um, uh, is Bigfoot beyond your wall? Is a question I've noticed. Is Bigfoot behind my wall? Uh, yeah. I'm Probably not at liberty not. to say. Uh, Aiden, I have a friend of a friend who snuck into our local Masonic temple and stole a staff, and I'm planning to do the same thing soon. Do you have any advice on the success of my mission? We don't have special staves. I'm very I think confused. your friend is well, lying. Stole to you. Them in that is scenario. Friend, no, no, there's, is this, is this there's friend one Alex thing. Jones? There's 
<laughs> There's one thing I can think of that they might be talking about, but it's not any sort of like special ceremonial symbol. It's it's just like left over from when people had arms. The, like half the lodge still sits with swords. I just don't know what your friend would have stolen, but don't do that. <clears throat> Simply because breaking breaking and entering is a very real charge. Stealing is bad. <laughs> it's true. Stealing. Uh, oh, Joshua, a, uh, super super chat yeah, at the Joshua Cooley for 10 said, as students of history, do you guys make any effort to get into the worldview slash headspace of the medieval or ancient peoples you study? Do you get into in medieval and ancient philosophy, etc.? You, you do guys? that extensively, Aiden. I know yeah. that for a fact from all of our conversations that we've had. Yeah, I like to I like to look at as many angles as I can um, to, to try and understand how people I work. I, I think that is, and, and please pardon the pun, um, I think that is the allure of your videos um, in, in, a, in a way, because where, where you, you, you clearly come across from the modern mindset and at the same time you're hitting, like from mm. the discussions we've had more on mythology side, um, like you have, because that, that's where I find it easier to get in the headspace of when I'm discussing mythology. Because yeah. if you think about it, mythology and folklore is you are looking at the thought process of the person mm -hmm. of that time. Like yes. when I did Black Annis, um, where she's such a, a recent figure, mm -hmm. um, she's completely different to all of the stuff that everyone was suggesting she was based off of, which is why I actually threw a lot of those hypotheses out. Mm -hmm. She's also the only mythological figure I've covered that I didn't think existed at any point in time, but that's a different story. <laughs> uh, I just like the, the idea that Kelpies were real. <laughs> I, I haven't covered Kelpies yet. I, oh, okay. It's not, it's, it, it, there is truth behind every. I I I I know quite um quite a few Scottish people, and they will. If you talk about stuff, they'll they'll just sort of nod and go, yeah, yeah, no, we don't we don't believe it anymore. And then I go, <laughs> yeah, we're alone now. We're in the pub. It's yeah. fine. No one can hear us. <laughs> like, I'm not going to talk about this on the podcast in a few weeks' time. I do, oh, I, yeah, do yeah. I do love that when Dussie has come a, come to be a thing because it's like basically taking the Bath and She and applying it to the Wendigo. Yeah. Like, for those who don't know the Bad and She, uh, she appears to men who uh, are out in the wilderness and have expressed a wish for some companionship. She's a beautiful young woman who appears and, uh, you know, seduces you and then rips open your chest and uh, sucks out all your blood and eats your organs. Sounds like something that is similar to uh, the Lady in White. Yeah. That is seen in yeah. a lot of stuff within the Caribbean culture here. My, my wife has told me extensively about all different kinds of stories of family members and, and and friends who have interacted or had experiences that they just all collectively know. You see a lady in white standing on the side of the road. You turn around, you head the other way. Tell you what, is another piece of modern folklore. Have you, have you guys heard of the Serbian dancing lady? No, I'm not. I she's one that I wanted Maybe? to cover recently. Maybe. Basically, it's a very very modern phenomenon. It started on TikTok as all, as all great trends come mm -hmm. now. Where the, in, yeah, there is video yeah, I know what you're talking about. Where it's a lady dancing with her back to you, and the second she turns to you, mm -hmm. you're dead. She's gonna come at you with a knife. And the the hypothesis is is actually just a crazy Serbian lady who likes to stab people. <laughs> just a crazy Serbian lady. Um, I like how like the response spirit. from the commenter down here talking about these subjects. Power holder too. I can fix her. <laughs> yeah, we, we can do, Listen, we can do it, laddie. That's that's me every time I talk about Medusa, right? That, oh, I, no. I, I sim okay, she's I learned... my mythological thing. I, I did not Medusa know Medusa's and... story was as tragic as it is. Oh, it's that's so. Why, I, had I had the Percy right. Jackson version. I had the Percy Jackson version. Which version? The, the where... Roman version or the Greek version? What the? Hmm? There, there's like three different versions of Medusa. It's true. Did, did you say the Roman here, version? All of them are. The, the Roman version. Oh, I thought you version. said the Mormon version. <laughs> no. And I was like, there's a Mormon Medusa? <laughs> I really want to see I really want to see a Mormon version of Medusa now. Yeah, yeah hair isn't snakes, snakes it's all venomous. sister wives. They just inject caffeine, which damns you to hell. <laughs> um, but no, in the, in the traditional, like, because in one, in the oldest versions I know of where is, she is a Gorgon from the start, then in the regular Greek stories, obviously cursed by Athena and all that yeah. stuff. Um, but like a lot of them, uh, it's the Roman version that's the most tragic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, which looks like uh, that was what I grew up on was the Roman version. I was like, one, oh, this is it's horrible. The one I grew up on was uh, that she was a Gorgon from the start. The one that I yeah. learned 
in my younger years was that she and uh, Poseidon had a, a thing going. And well, that they had a thing going in Athena's temple. Yeah. And Athena cursed her for that. Turns out that's right actions, wrong uh, context. Yep. So I was I was not aware of that fact growing up, and I learned wasn't that in the it last that she year. wasn't a willing participant yes. in yes. one of these? That's is the that Roman she version. was forced to, and then was then punished for it? Yes. yes. And Which... then Athena, and then Athena sent men to kill her as well because Athena was just Athena in, in any of the versions, the, the the Roman version, the slightly less bad Greek version, or even the Gorgon version. She does not come off good in any of them. I you have think a very... about a lot of the women in varying different parts of Greek tragedies, and you, and you really re realize within this just how many situations in which it's like, oh, yes, and this person was seduced. Were they seduced? Zeus has we know they the had relations, but we yeah. don't know the willingness of yeah. it in that scenario. Oh. And then you'll, you'll come to almost... notice that women are not highly regarded in a lot of ancient Greek in, in Oh, yeah, no, in ancient society. Greek society, absolutely not. <laughs> and then almost without exception, they get screwed over. After this, getting screwed, Arachne women had example. it slightly better. Spartan women had it better. A little bit slightly. better. Yeah. <laughs> like Although, that. if their baby was born a little too skinny, it got thrown off a cliff. So, yeah. And simultaneously, if you were a woman that at that point that was incapable of producing children, mm -hmm. oh, you basically lost all rights. Yep. You were better off moving to another city. Yeah. Ironically, like, you'd be better off going to Athens, and Athens was like awful for women at that oh, point. In time. I see a another super chat. Yeah, from, uh, June. I just saw that oh, yeah. one. The uh, the Athen <laughs> the Athenians hated women so much that they decided that like I know pedophilia was a better option. Uh, <laughs> pederasty. Sorry, that's that's the term. not where I thought. That's not where I thought you were going. <laughs> I think I was going. I thought you were going. Being a bottom was a better better, better option because they, you're, you're, they had a you're... thing against them. You're you're part of the you're part of the that. umbrella. You're that. part of the umbrella. I, can I can't I can say that. You that, can yeah. make that joke. I can, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll say say this because I know it sounds a little bit awkward here, especially when we're on that subject. It, it's one of the more recent things that we've came to kind of understand when looking at stuff with history. That even when talking about say homosexual relations in Athens and at the time and that history, is that it has actually played up significantly more in the modern day and age mm -hmm. than it ever yes. actually was. And that was something that I learned even fairly recently going back into it, because naturally I was one of those people who grew up thinking like, oh yeah, of course. It's, you know, the classic joke, Gre Greeks and homosexual relations and uh, yeah. like homosexual relations were referred to as Greek love in Rome. That was one of yeah. the derogatory names, etc. And then you realize actually in going through and doing the studies and the artwork from what they've been able to find is that there was a sizable percentage that occurred within elite societies or elite the elite population within societies like Athens, but it wasn't really common elsewhere. We just get this overall perception of the Greeks, despite having vastly different cultures across thousands mm -hmm. of different cities. Yeah, I mean, we're even the difference between like, uh, yeah. I mean, the Tarsus and Sparta would have been two different countries, like. Oh, easy. I, you wouldn't. They they would not have recognized oh, yeah. each other as. Oh, we're both Greek. I like, mean, they were a war of each other most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> um. So June, uh, Hasiga Hasigawa. Now there's a there's a there's an actual spelling guide in this super chat. Um. Missed the last few streams, so here's some penance, Dala. Love seeing guests on board. For the record, it's pronounced Hasigawa. Bless Thornbury's attempts in the past. <laughs> I anytime I see somebody with a confusing name in there, I try to beat him to it. <laughs> Not a confusing name, like a, a complicated I, non English name. I mean, it's, it's just Japanese for like Hasegawa. Yeah. Like, that, that's this is what it would be there. Yeah, I would assume so. I, I do want to, I do want to, I do want to quickly add going back into the um, like the LGBT stuff not being as prevalent as we would talk growing up. Um, I would really like Hadrian growing up for 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 similar reasons. I was like, oh, cool, he's like on every on every website that talks about um gay history specifically he is championed as a pariah please stop doing that the man dated a 13 year old or met him and then and then they were friends and then they dated that's called grooming no ah. hadrian was not a good person adrian hey, am i right <laughs> stop stop right. saying to hadrian people <laughs> sorry oh and that's my rant for tonight right. i just i get very upset when people simp for hadrian 
because what we're talking about chat has devolved just look at this in order zeus has never had sexual inter or had oh, sexual no, intercourse no. once i don't oh, think no. any of the greek gods were good that is <laughs> that's not, very true some of them were like when you look at say uh like hestia and other things that are like the goddesses of the hearth and the ones that were smaller at home gods and goddesses those were fine Persephone was a but, good goddess but Persephone oh, was a good goddess it's true but like of the major ones like what the big 13 if you will they were all shit mm -hmm. except except if ice this if ice this was just a guy that got screwed over i, I will i will say that <clears> his story <throat> sucks overall and i feel bad for him did Aphrodite <laughs> do anything bad i think most of the good greek gods were women <laughs> no if <laughs> ice <laughs> tried to help people multiple times and so he would if when one of the other gods pissed him off he would give help to a mortal for something like for a, a piece of armor or weapon or whatever and that would be a person that would be a hero but again because we're talking about the greeks anything that the gods intervene in is going to become a tragedy sorry i'm just i'm reading through looking for something i love him <laughs> That the, you got me. You I got me totally it. invested when you said read through these in order, because like I, no, seriously, because you look through it and it got yeah, real all, active, real I, quick, as everyone just started talking Greek. Yeah, I mean, there is my. I, my I like. I, I, I did. We 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 missed the the Rick Reardon version is the Mormon version, which was a great chat. It was a great comment. I have a sweaty booty is in here. Uh oh no! Someone said not the Medusi. Oh. <laughs> yeah, they did. Oh no, guys! I oh, know I can't say that. I can't say that on YouTube. I can't say that on YouTube. I'll tell you. I'll tell you up. I'll tell you after what the just went The new high KB super chat. Zeus had Hera, a literal goddess, as a wife, and he yep. still cannot keep it in his pants. What the fuck was yeah. wrong with the guy? <laughs> um, Zeus, he was, he was a literal Zeus, god. He was Zeus a literal was god. what we like to call a <laughs> plot device in Greek <laughs> history. <laughs> that you like to use his plot <laughs> device to thicken things. He used his plot device a lot. That is not... one way to describe it, I suppose. Um, plot I'm device. Really, I'm pretty proud of that Did one. You ever right hear the, the story? I don't know how true this. I remember. I remember this one. Um, he he one time turned himself into a cabinet to seduce a queen. Apparently, um, that was his whole seduction plan. And it worked. Was cabinet? And whenever, when it, I can't remember. I heard this story years ago, and I remember listening to it. And I was like, "How did he seduce her as a cabinet?" And then as I got older, I was like, "I don't think he seduced her as the cabinet. I think he was the cabinet to sneak into her room." Yeah. And then the story gets darker, and the Greeks allow it to be at that. So then he disguised himself as a cabinet <clears throat> or hid inside of a cabinet. No, he. Uh, 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 the story I remember as a kid was that he disguised himself as a cabinet. I don't know if it's actual Greek mythology, if it was just what I was like listening to. I'm fairly, it was probably from watching like horrible histories or something. I just have a no, very I, strong I, memory of that I story. I could believe it being that, but I could also believe it being, you know, a, a mistranslation. <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me. Because there's so many things that you come across that you're like, hmm. Like we have stuff all the time where uh, there's, a, there's a document by uh, William Strachey from like 1611 <laughs> uh, where he talks about the uh, Powhatan. <laughs> And says that they took apes in the mountains, as in they hunted apes in the mountains. The mountains being the mm. Appalachians. Uh, Steven, when's the last time you saw an ape in the Appalachians that wasn't in the zoo? What you just said really confused me there for a second. I was trying to process and think, did I miss something in the sentence for the previous like minute? Nope. What, 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 do, you, what do you mean? No, he, he just writes that the natives take apes in the Appalachians. He, the, the natives take apes in the mountains. <laughs> talking about their hunting practices and and you got to sit there you got to sit there as a as a serious historian and you got to ask yourself did strakey just get something wrong in what they were saying or is this a native reference to bigfoot and you have no, to ask I, that question as a serious historian steven yeah i i understand that i understand that I, i'm trying to think of what it could possibly apply to in that scenario for something that we, if they're describing something as an ape that would not actually be an ape because even then when they say an ape they're they're not necessarily talking about something that would be all that large so like there haven't been any native apes in the north american continent for 26 million years exactly so they have to be talking um, about hominids mm -hmm. I, I, 
or or it's just a mistranslation and they said something about there being you know savage tribes that they hunt in the mountains which is still a weird thing to do granted the powhatan yeah, did a lot of other weird stuff so not the most weird thing they could you know that they're uh, the ottawa have a situation where they were accused of uh capturing and i think it was boiling alive a chieftain of the miami and then eating him after a battle during the uh the seven years war i think oh yeah i've come across some real nonsense from from both the settlers and the natives between the settlers and the natives between the natives and the natives and between the settlers and the settlers I don't think there was any records of those tribes, though, of cannibalistic practices. Like, th there were some in, in some there's places, but I don't few... think that tribe had that. Nope, there's a few anecdotes where they're like, ah, and they did this. Interesting thing about the Ottawa, they saw cannibalism as a massive taboo, and they're the people who came up with the Wendigo. Oh, yeah, no, that would make more sense then. So, the fact that an Ottawa chieftain chose to eat somebody... <clears throat> is either something that is massively taboo within his own culture and he did it as a power move or it's something that the miami made up knowing that there was a cannibalism thing with the ottawa but the cannibalism thing with the ottawa was that the ottawa really didn't like cannibalism there's also some it could stuff be a about very easy way to poison people against them yeah, there's some stuff about the susquehanna like, as well true. yeah hey to, to to lighten things up while we're talking about the Wendigo, did you notice a hypothesis that if enough people believe in a thing, there's a chance that that thing may actually become real? Are you talking about, uh, yes, talking, you talking about a New strategy. Age Tulpa? Yes, I understand. Yeah. Yes. I yes. like how you went Warhammer and I went. A I was actually I was actually direction. referencing the orcs in Warhammer. But... <laughs> yeah, I, that would be the case. I thought you were referencing Tulpas. This is this um, is the problem with me okay. being the folklore guy now. Is See, I, 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 that's literally all I know about Warhammer lore. My, my friend was trying to, to describe it to me earlier, and he was like, you just, just listen to a, a Warhammer podcast. And I was like, I, I, there's too much in my brain at the moment. Ah, I'm struggling. It's, just, it's the same thing as Star Wars, man. You know, there's there's some there's magic. Not, there's some you different have races. Any idea how many people you Star Wars, by saying Star Wars, it's, it's the same. Star Wars has Star Wars. hyperspace. Uh, I'm, Warhammer I'm, I'm has show, literal I'm hell. I showed a clip of you saying it's like Star Wars to my Warhammer friends. I, I, I And then I'm going to send you I like, the reaction. I like how in the continued context, it's very clear that I understand that I'm, I'm just pissing people off, but that's going to make me look so... <laughs> So bad if it's clipped i should not have said that that was probably the most cancelable thing i've said on this show um yeah but you do have it somewhat right star wars does have uh <laughs> ha has hyperspace and warhammer has hell yeah I, I can piss off a lot more people saying that I... harry potter is a ripoff of star wars um <laughs> i i uh, my my inner film students wants to come out and say every film and book is a ripoff of the other um i haven't i have wrote an essay on this and i got there first. has not been an original um, film since <laughs> citizen kane um since since <laughs> there, there, in, there hasn't, this sounds like my kind of come on in. there there hasn't Thor there hasn't, just arrived there hasn't been an original film, film since rescued by like rover it might be right up my alley. hang on for the last two minutes of the show i'll let you uh yeah. grab a Some headset here parent. say hello yeah you, yeah, you take those um, ones but yeah, no, I, I, I actually argue that Star Wars in Star Wars is a complete ripoff of 2001 A Space Odyssey. So the first one I in heard, my essay. the first one I heard is you saying that you thought Harry Potter was a ripoff of uh, Star Wars. Oh, then no, I, I said that would be I, I could piss a lot more people off saying Harry Potter is a ripoff of Star Wars. Yeah. And then I said that there is no original films. And then I said there hasn't been an original film since Citizen Kane. Fair. Arguably, that's derivative. <laughs> you know what we need is we need another show where it's just Ryan and Aiden talking about film, but you they know, both get blitzed beforehand. Up. We've been saying that we're going to do that. I just, yeah. We just need to do it. Yeah. We was literally messaging each other about this the other day, and then we oh. both went, okay, cool, we'll, we'll sort this out at yeah. some point. I'm saying <laughs> right now, sloshed. Aiden, yeah. the thing that I got started on in the first place is doing dumb events in history. True. Do you have any idea, if you really wanted a fun episode for a show, it's let's get drunk and talk about stupid shit that has happened in history just like really dumb events cool. and how it all played out it sounds I mean, like, really give, risky. give me an example why don't we get here why like, don't we why don't we, an, why don't we get an airbnb in virginia and Ooh. and we all just do a live so let's be fair uh might be a little difficult for ryan well not ryan <laughs> 
Ryan can conference I, I, in. Well, you can, you should get um, one of those little. You know that you know that. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm mildly terrified of flying, but I'll, I'll, I'll that's fine. I'll, I'll, you can do you the Mr. C thing where you like knock me out. If you knock me out, do the Mr. C thing, just knock me out, and then I wake up and Murdoch's flying the helicopter. Exactly. Um, so but if I, I can just... give an example of the thing here, because I was asked if I could give an example, it's like one of my favorite things. The first viral video that I ever had on anything on TikTok was my personal favorite dumb event, mm -hmm. which is the Dublin Whiskey Fire. And for anyone who hasn't heard about this, who doesn't know what it is, it, it's hilarious. Back in the mid to late 1800s, you have this whiskey distillery in Dublin, Ireland, which one night tragically catches fire. And it's it's a horrible loss for the Irish because thousands whiskey. of barrels of whiskey are lost. And it, it's terrible. Yeah. And 13 people ended up dying that night. Less Amazingly loss. enough, here's the funny thing. Here's the funny thing. This is where it gets weird. Why it's a whole dumb event. Um, yeah, the, 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 the whiskey begins to explode. The barrels are all on fire inside of this factory. It explodes, sending a literal flaming river of whiskey running down through the streets of Ireland, like through Dublin, right? And this creates a literal flaming river of alcohol that is picking up all of the horse shit and dirt and everything that is in the road and carrying it down. And you have people lining up for two miles to take every kind of cup, every tin, every kind oh. of container that you could imagine. And they are just going to it and scooping it up because it's free boots. Oh. Amazingly, that night, no one died in the fire. But 13 people died of alcohol poisoning in Dublin that day. <laughs> I'm surprised nobody died of other sorts of poisoning. Maybe more people got sick afterwards, but we know that 13, 13 people died that night from alcohol poisoning. How do you drink and that so is a much dumb street event in whiskey? History. How do you drink so much street whiskey? That was on you're fire not, you're not and Irish, covered in shit. <laughs> no, apparently yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. That'll be determined. So, I'm about as Irish as I am Jewish. Yeah. So so here's here's what they did. So what they first tried to do, what they tried to stop this event, it, it gets even, even dumber, right? So it's flowing through the streets, and the streets don't have drainage, right? They they kind of flex on either side where ruts of carts would be. So it begins to fill up and form an actual creek, if you mm -hmm. will. So the police and fire department comes in and they try and divert it by utilizing sandbags. And so they put sand and sawdust and all this stuff up. But then what ends up happening is because it's porous, it ends up just soaking through the sandbags that they had because it wasn't as good as I guess uh -huh. was what they used in later construction and it doesn't stop the flow. So in order to stop it, they then get massive piles of horse and sheep dung and create walls of shit in order to contain it. That probably had to smell like I I can't imagine because I've been in New York City. Alcohol in feces. I, I've been in New York City in the summer and I know how bad that smells. So, like, it's probably that times, like, a hundred, and that is yeah, brutal. No. I'm loving the comment I'm seeing here, Sam T, is they took fireball shots too seriously. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Amazing. We are getting uh, past the end of the show, though, and we have we have I... uh, other stuff we got to do. So let's take these last two Super Chats and then do outro. We have one from Justin Hoff that says, Can we get a shirt with Wendussie and Sasquatch getting married? I have to... Ask Norman for yet another terrible favor. Do you know um, how many shirts we have lined up that people have asked us for? I'm still trying to get Norman to do the sexy Wendigo for me, and he keeps telling me that he just can't bring himself to do it. Uh, you need to do the, you need I to got do an the... artist that can do it for you. If you want one, I got one that has made a lot of stuff of controversial historical. We we one of the things that we're considering doing is we plan on making um uh gender bent characters in of history to go on body pillows. That's amazing. So That's what, brilliant. like a sexy George Washington woman? Like a sexy femme George Washington. Um, like Teddy Roosevelt with his massive pecs, but it's it, it it's like not pecs. So instead of femboy hooters, would, it's femboy just... founding fathers. Oh yeah. my god. I like they have that. a villain line, femboy Hitler. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that one's even insulting. I think that's the best way to remember his memory. Probably. <laughs> I think Hitler oh. should be remembered for what he was. A femboy. A femboy. I want to see. I want to see the rest of these body pillows. I want to okay. see. I want to see the sales on those. I want to see how many people buy them, because that that would be really interesting. To June Hasegawa had that uh, has the the super chat, and then I saw his comment at the end that said that sounds like fate. Yeah, that basically is. It's it's the plot of fate, just with dumber shit. Amazing. <laughs> God. All right, here we go. Uh, last one was also June Hasegawa, uh, who did give us a, a pronunciation guide for her name because oh, of you. her thank or his. You. I think. 
Sorry, I'm an idiot. Yeah. Um. <laughs> uh, who said Harry Potter is actually plagiarized? I just wish I could remember the original piece of literature's name. Yeah, it was Star Wars, the 1997, 1997, 1977 film by George Lucas. Come on, guys. Well, there was the 1997 re-release. True. <laughs> she. J.K. Rowling was sitting there like, you know, this is a good, this is a good idea. <laughs> All right. Who? Okay, here we go. So that is it uh, for the actual content of the show. Let's go around and do outros. Ryan, let's start with you, my friend. Uh, yes, thank you for thank you um, thank you both for having me on. Um, you can find me over on YouTube at, at History Daddy on TikTok as History Daddy and on Instagram as History Daddy. Um, I do on obviously on YouTube. I do my long form content where I go more in depth and I try. And, there is a nice focus on comedy and it's 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 slightly darker and edgier in, in places. Um, we do have some jokes about taxes and pirates and stuff. It's all good. It's all fun and games. Um, and then on for the, the short form sketches and stuff, you look on TikTok and Instagram Reels. Um, and yeah, but thank you again for, for having me on. All right. Yeah. I, before we get to Steven, I just really quickly, somebody in the chat said, uh, <clears throat> I mean, King Arthur was not a historical figure. I take, I take issue with that statement. I disagree with that as well. <laughs> About half of historians it's... would agree with that statement, but another half would say no. Is, <laughs> is it just someone a who's comment? Who... Yeah. Or... Okay. I, I've said this before. My name is is Ryan Arthur Day. It translates from Irish to Little King Arthur. <laughs> That's, That's pretty awesome. great, actually. It's yeah. very personal when people don't believe in King Arthur. <laughs> I don't necessarily know that he would be a figure we would recognize based on most of the stories about him. the 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 King Arthur, you know, if you're working off of the the French material, is is not the the historical one, but there is it's the Welsh stuff. It's a, the Welsh a, stuff. Yeah, there is a possible right. historical Arthur, but that person would have been considerably less accomplished. Uh, yeah, the the one written about by Nennius uh, a few hundred years later won twelve battles and was an elected general. So, but all right, and Stephen, for your outro, my friend. All right. Well, uh, for anyone who doesn't recognize me, uh, I'm Stucky, or depending on if you follow me on any of my other socials here, it's either Stucky for gaming stuff, or if you're looking more for long form history for my stuff, the History of Everything podcast, because I got my own podcast that I do with my wife, uh, Gabby, or not Gabby B. It depends on exact. We have so many varying names yeah. over so many different things that I get kind of confused as to what I should even say in this point. It's, you, gotta it's go really... back. you gotta go back to being 15 and just find a way to brand your own whole name. I know, right? So, Stucky oh, or the like History of Everything podcast, whatever it is that you're looking for, that's what we are. They're on most of the other platforms for short form or long form gaming content. It's Stucky. And then it's actually one of the funny details I'll put here in the end that we have History Daddy here because when I got first started on TikTok, there was this whole funny joke of how people continuously would call me History Daddy. Like that was my nickname that mm -hmm. people called me, even though that wasn't my actual handle. And then my wife came to me one day when we were at like, 30 40 thousand like followers at the time here like back in the beginning and they went hey um there's an actual channel called <laughs> history daddy and people keep on thinking that i'm i'm like trying to get him to come after you um yeah i remember this well um sh should we be concerned and so that's As where you can see, came... Ryan's a very violent and scary individual. Yeah, yeah. with my mustache, I was so confused because I kept getting tags like, "Hey, they're like this, this, this is history. This history that you think's being like nicked for me." And I was like, "What?" And then I like commented it as a joke, and then I just did a joke video, which was yeah. a very yeah. funny. I think that was like the second or first, might have been the first interaction we had actually. I yeah. think. So then it became history zaddy. <laughs> yeah. Zaddy, oh good god! <laughs> my camera's going. Well, oh, no. I'm a. Uh... <laughs> I'm stuck over here with Lore Daddy. That's fine. Or, well, that's one of many that you have. And Lore Father. Me. Also Milk Master. There it is. Yeah, Milk Master is the... Seems yeah. to be the favorite. Um, well, I, I introduce Aiden, but he gets to introduce himself all the time. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, no. Actually, wait, no, this is going on the History Hut channel. Do you want to tell him who you are and why you're here? Yeah, so I'm the other part of the Lore Lodge. Uh, yeah, I am the tech side of everything. I film and then edit everything, and then we do the podcast together on Sunday nights uh and he stays behind the camera because as you can see he is just horrifically ugly yeah I've truly a, a crime to even expose you all I've, I've got a face for radio so <laughs> yeah, it, it, it looks like his hair has been taped down whereas yours is taped up yeah it's true you know what that's <laughs> i mean how we're doing it, it. technically has been 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's uh he's the reason that I look so pretty. Um anyway, part of what keeps you pretty. You, Thank you've you. got a lot just Thank naturally you. going Thank for you. yourself. Uh, <laughs> We're just feeding the ship at this point. <laughs> okay. Uh, putting wind in just quickly, the traveling the traveling bard says law father. That one too. Yeah. That one's That too. one's probably my favorite. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. All right. Well, especially the way Ryan says it. The, the British Law accent really helps. Yeah. Okay. Law Fav. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for hanging out, for watching. Again, this is going to be a monthly show. We're going to have a rotating cast. I'm sure Ryan's going to be back. Uh, we have a few more people that oh. I've talked to recently as well, so I'm pretty excited. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm, I'm Aiden Mattis. I'm the host of the Lore Lodge. And uh, thank, you for, thank you for hanging out. Bye, guys. Bye.